Welcome to the Head and Neck Cancer 2020 video series. Presented by St. Vincent's Hospital Sydney, the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and St. Vincent's Private Hospital Sydney. Managing Distress and Recovery with Teresa Simpson and Michelle Roach. Now we're joined by two people who work with patients on a daily basis at Liverpool Hospital in South West Sydney. And it's my great pleasure now to welcome a nurse, a clinical nurse consultant, and also a psycho-oncology social worker. Can you introduce yourself and, and, and in a nutshell tell us what you do? Hi everyone, my name is Teresa Simpson. I'm a psychosocial oncology social worker and work in Liverpool Hospital since 1998. And what do those words mean? A psycho-oncology social worker, what, what is it in plain English? What do you do? Well, it's predominantly working with cancer patients and, um, and we are a, a team of psychosocial professional uh, to provide people who have, you know, uh, psychological issue or uh, social issue when um, they are in their cancer journey. And Teresa, I know that you've worked with head and neck cancer patients for many years and you have, I feel, a very deep feeling for this group of patients. Talk to me about the longer term impacts on patients and, and the sort of challenges, you know, that make your heart still crack a little bit even after all this time. I think, you know, as cancer treatment is... Um getting better and better results and and we no longer see cancer is um, a life-threatening disease uh, but more is a chronic illness and and people surviving longer or living longer with cancer and with some of our hair and neck cancer because of the side effect of the treatment because of um, how the cancer affecting their daily life. Um, and, and to live a long term is, it takes effort, you know, it takes effort to learn with, um, to live with side effect. Uh, Give me some examples of ones that you've noticed people find really tough. Well, probably change of their appearance, change of their body image, uh, because it's predominantly in this area and it's all these vital organs that is being affected. Um, you know, they, may, they might be dribbling a little bit, uh, they might have dry mouth because of their medication. Or the radiation? Or the radiation, they might have hearing problem, but there is that hidden uh, disability. Uh, or changes in their life that they have to um, continue to live day by day. Having a cancer diagnosis is not all negative because it actually, for some people, it opens a door for them to grow, to, to yeah, to grow possibly, uh, positively, you know. And Teresa, can I say, you yourself live with a, a significant health issue. So when you say that, you're drawing partly, aren't you, on your own experience. Do you mind just telling us what you live with and, and what insight that gives you into what some head and neck cancer patients go through? So I have a spinal cord tumour back in 2009 and operated on. And um, it's amazing that, um, that I didn't end up uh, as a full paraplegic, but a partial paraplegic. So I live with a disability. Um, have gone for, uh, you know, surgeries and uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. Um, I live with pain, uh, despite the surgery was successful. So I know how our patient feel as being the patient, you know, and um, and also living with a chronic condition, or me living with a physical disability. 
Um, so I can understand that um, when the patient talking about that they're being stared, um, they could not communicate properly. For me, being a migrant, you know, and English is my second language. Uh, it's not my native. Uh, so, um, so I understand. There are times that you feel really resentful what's happening to you, but there are other times that um, that what happened to me or my disability is open another door for me because I since I found uh, after my um, my surgery, um, I feel like that. I really understand how some of our patients feel. In the uh, stories of the patients we saw at the beginning of this video, people spoke very emotionally about grief and depression and anger. Um, and they talked about some of the things that they do, uh, routine, peer support, going to support groups, getting up and doing something social. Uh, wearing clothes and having a cup of coffee or whatever. Yeah. In a nutshell, based on the many head and neck cancer patients that you've worked with over the years, can you give us three or four tips uh, for people watching this who are saying, you know, what can I do to lift my spirits so that I can enjoy my life as best I can? And I think the probably the first tip is thank you for the advanced healthcare we have that we are survive. We are surviving another day and, and we can continue to live on. We have, uh, we, and we can make choices of how we living with this chronic condition or disability. What sort of choices? Positive choices. Um, and I think there's a, a balance, um, you know. Um, life is not all about um, good things or happy things, you know. There are a lot of, I get it, it's up or down. And nobody can be positive at all time. And I think if having that balance, you know, um, rather than say to yourself that, I'm fine, I'm doing well, uh, this is good. But also acknowledge your loss and grief, you know. Um, and remember um, the achievement you make every day because it takes courage to live with a medical condition or a disability. Um, because it's sometimes it's so draining, you know, um, that, um, you know, every few sentence you're jubilant, you have to wipe your mouth, you know. But, but that being brave and being, getting yourself out there and um, is the best thing, you know. Uh, it's like me uh, using a walking stick, me in a wheelchair that people will be staring at. Um, is to keep going. If people staring, then smile, because usually they're just curious, you know. But it takes gas, and at the same time, it's very draining. So having that balance, you know, it is important. So if you feel you need to cry, then you cry, you know. It took me three months to cry about my disability. Yeah. Um, and I, not just having tears, I was boring my eyes out and crying like a baby for 15 minutes. And, and there are days that, you know, um, it's particularly hard. Uh, and I'm sure for our head and neck cancer patient, you know. But if we don't do something that, like, depression, being sad, feeling that 
what's the point to go on with my life, my life is gone, then your life will be gone. So if you have, if you have those feelings of depression, why go on? Because we know there is, for head and neck cancer patients, we do have a higher level of taking our own lives uh, than other cancers. Just in a nutshell, what is your advice if you've got those very dark feelings? What should people do? Speak out, expose, go and ask for help. There's heaps of information on the website. Go to your doctor, go to your GP, you know, speak out or even call Cancer Council. Mm, 13, 11, 20. That's right, you know, and they will ask you questions. Their staff is very well trained and will refer you to the clinician that you, you can get the help. Look, thank you so much, Teresa. And I, I, I come now uh, to our clinical nurse consultant. Michelle, can you introduce yourself and, uh, and, and tell us who you are and what you do? Hi, Julie, I'm Michelle. I work at Liverpool Hospital in the Cancer Therapy Centre and I'm obsessed with radiotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, so I'm the clinical nurse consultant in radiotherapy. So all things radiotherapy, I'm your woman. And we're going to have a, a whole video in this series, uh, which is looking at innovations to help people who've uh, experienced head and neck cancer, a whole program that's just on radiation therapy. But today we're focusing on managing distress. And I think I'd like to hear from you about the pre-treatment clinic you have and what you do there that particularly goes to the question of finding out if someone might need emotional support. Okay, so we have a clinic at my place at Liverpool and it's called the Head and Neck Pretreatment Clinic. No doctors allowed. So a patient has to meet a certain criteria and our care coordinators our, or our cancer care coordinators or our doctors might highlight that this person is appropriate for our Head and Neck Pretreatment Clinic. And the people involved in that are a speech therapist, a dietitian, a social worker, and me. If they're a surgical patient, they'll see our head and neck clinical nurse consultant. And one of us will phone that patient, invite them along to an appointment with us. And we make it quite clear that doctors are not involved in this appointment. And it's just, the foundations of that clinic are to provide education and support for a patient before they start their treatment. And the hope of that is, forearmed is forewarned, education, the patient has an understanding, somewhat of an understanding on what's going to happen throughout their treatment. And is it in a way the beginning of a relationship with the nursing and allied health team. Just as a, a patient myself seven years ago, the, the nurse in particular played a, she was almost like an air traffic controller, you know, that all the team were aeroplanes and she'd land the right plane for me when I needed it. So is it the beginning of a relationship? That's a beautiful way to put it because until we've spoken about that and, and until you've said that, it actually exactly, it's exactly what it is. Because if a patient's, had started their treatment or, and they see a social worker, like they're, they're in the treatment mode. If we can do that beforehand, hopefully it gives the patient some confidence, some education and some understanding of what we're there for and who they can contact if they've got a problem. And do you give them a telephone number? Yep, so all of us give them a con our own contact numbers. So they may walk out of that appointment with four contact numbers. And I'm one of the last speakers to go in and meet. We do it individually. And I'm one of the last people that go in. And, and I acknowledge that potentially that person and their support person may be quite overwhelmed. So my whole role there is to get to know you and say, hey, listen, this is who I am. And based on, you get a feeling for what, if they want to know a lot of information or if they go, you know what, too much, I need to go. Yeah. 
who you're going to call, call me. I may not have every single answer for that person. I may not have been in there when the social worker was talking to them, but I know how to get in contact with these people. So I can traffic control. Your point of contact. The, the other uh, uh, message I think that came through very strongly from some of those patients we saw at the beginning of this video was a cry for peer support. Uh, a chance to be part of a support group. And, I, and we've already heard from uh, Dr. Ben Britton, the clinical psychologist, that not, e not everybody wants a group. Some people prefer their privacy. But at Liverpool Hospital over about seven or eight years, for quite a bit of the time, there has been a support group. Just to get in a nutshell, tell us what sort of things do you do at the support group and how do you think it helps people? So the Head and Neck support group was already established when I came to work at Liverpool about six years ago. And the philosophy of the support group is just to be there for each other. So any patient, whether they have just been diagnosed during their treatment or they're five years after treatment, they can come along, we have at the same time every month, and. We have some people working behind the scenes that send out 300 letters every couple of months. It's amazing what happens behind the scenes. And we have education sessions of the new advances in treatment. And sometimes I say to my patients, you've passed your treatment, but we still have these radiotherapy, and they go, we just want to know what's going on. Like, it's really interesting. So patients, no matter what stage they are along their journey, their treatment, their survivorship phase, they come, they touch base with each other. One of our patients thinks he's a, a chef, he'll make food. So we have a, a, the formal session of the day where it's education, we have an invited speaker. And then we have the social part where the patients just sit around and one of the speakers earlier today mentioned that tips and tricks, we've actually produced a tips and tricks based on the feedback from our, our group, what got them through. Okay, so sort of advice from fellow patients. Yeah, yeah. Look, at my, thank you so much for that. And, and I have attended that yes, uh, support group as a speaker and, uh, and I, I, was, um, I was very moved to be with my peers. Uh, I, it, there is something about being with people who've been through the same challenge, difficulties, it's very, very special, it's very, very comforting. But just our last thing is, I, uh, one of your passions, as I understand it, is the training of, of nurses to particularly understand head and neck cancer patients and to have specialist head and neck cancer nurses. And I think we're aware that there are specialist breast cancer nurses. I think the, the gentlemen who have prostate cancer, we've got now uh, uh, well over 40 prostate cancer nurses nationally. What's your dream? If I, if I came back in five years time, what's the dream for you with, with specialist head and neck cancer nurses? It is my dream to have specialist head and neck cancer nurses. Our speakers this morning, and I think Ben said, um, it's so visible. If somebody's had a laryngectomy and they're breathing through a hole in their neck, you can't hide that. If somebody's had a big graft over their face, you can't hide that. A lot of other cancer sites, you can hide it. And you can walk down the street and nobody knows. Our head and neck cancer population, particularly during their treatment and just after, it's so obvious. Um, eating and drinking is so social. Come to my place and the first thing I say is, what do you want to drink? Some of these people can't eat and drink, so they're relying on a peg tube. Just explain a peg tube, because it hasn't been mentioned, yeah. A tube which goes into your belly to help you feed because of your reactions or your treatment, you can, or your surgery, you can't swallow food at the moment. Um, mostly it will improve. Sometimes people have feeding tubes for the rest of their life. But eating and drinking and talking, it is such a social thing. And for a head and neck cancer patient, that is so impacted. Six year, I, I used to say you can pick a head and neck cancer patient a mile off because I'll always have a bottle of water. If we're 
um, their, their saliva is an issue. So to have head and neck cancer nurses that are trained in that, that can not walk with the patient, that, that I don't mean that to be contrite, but to educate and support and tips and tricks and understand that I believe personally that the head and neck population, they're extremely complex, lots of issues. Hence why we have our head and neck support group and why you're here doing everything. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you so much, Teresa. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear about your work at Liverpool Hospital. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. And I want to thank you too for joining us to watch this video on managing distress with head and neck cancer patients. It's one of a series on innovations in care for both survival and quality of life. It's hosted by St Vincent's Hospital Sydney and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. And remember, if you've got any questions and you're in Australia, ring Cancer Council Information and Support Line 13 11 20, 13 11 20. Also the Beyond 5 website, www.beyond5.org.au. And we'll put other contact points, including for New Zealand, uh, on whatever site you're watching this video. And thank you very much. Head and Neck Cancer, Treatment Innovations, Improving Survival and Quality of Life. Providing up-to-date, evidence-based information for everyone in the head and neck cancer community. Presented by Julie McCrossan, a head and neck cancer survivor. Media production by Daniel Taylor at Insight IT. Celebrating World Head and Neck Cancer Day, 27th of July, 2020. Innovations in surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, dental care, managing distress and recovery, managing mask anxiety, remove the mask research, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients, family and community. Discussions of innovations that are improving survival and quality of life for patients with head and neck cancers. The 2020 Head and Neck Cancer Video Series. Presented by St Vincent's Hospital Sydney, the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and St Vincent's Private Hospital Sydney.